Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Q&A show. Uh, I, I want to invite everybody in here and welcome for joining us today. I am so thrilled to introduce you to the guest that I have scheduled here on the Q&A show. Uh, this is somebody that I've watched for many years on uh, a lot of the home shopping networks. And this gentleman is responsible probably for me buying probably over 50 watches from him. He probably doesn't even know it, but he's a consummate professional. Um, and I can't wait for him to get started and, and in, bring him in here in a second. Uh, but before we do get started, I want to welcome everybody that's in here. And uh, if you could do me a favor, if you could share and like and comment on here, uh, we want people to know that we're on. And if you happen to catch this broadcast in replay, if you see it later on down the road, please make sure that you uh, hashtag replay so that we know that you saw it. And don't be afraid to hit that heart button. Don't be afraid to hit that like button. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you have any questions, please, by all means, put them in here and we'll ask uh, my next guest. And like I said, he is someone that uh, has been on the air for uh, many years and we'll get all the details from him. But without further delay, let me introduce you to Tim Temple, everyone. Hello, Tim. How you doing, my friend? Hey, I am. I am great, Bob. Thanks for the invite. It's uh, my pleasure to do the show. In fact, I've been I've been looking forward to this, man. This will be fun. Oh yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, there's a lot of people that know who you are, especially if you're uh, into horology or watches. If you're uh, just even the 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 casual fan of watches, you've been on the air for many years with many networks. Um, wh where did you start? What where, where did you? How did you get into this this industry? You know, I uh, I actually kind of it kind of stumbled uh, into it uh, prior to to working with this. I was a uh, touring uh, keyboardist, and, and I still do that. Um, I'm, I'm based now in the uh, Nashville area, and uh, so I and now I've got the the project studio here, Black Rabbit Nashville. But long before I was doing the studio full time, I was I was touring, and usually because I'm a keyboardist. Usually, if you're a keyboardist with vocals, you just you know you work all the time, and as as fate would have it, uh, there there wasn't a tour, and there wasn't a band, so. I ended up answering, and this is this is going to be weird. I answered a tiny ad in the paper. It was like the classifieds. It was just this little postage stamp. There was nothing elaborate, and it said, "Can you sell things on TV?" Phone number. Wow, that's now, I never heard of it. I had never seen it. The closest I, I I can recall ever seeing this was way back in the day. You would go to if you're at Disney World and you went to Space Mountain. They have this, and it's still there now, but it's changed dramatically, but they had this dinorama of the future. And part of the future was this woman ordering dishes off of TV. Hmm. And that was my only exposure. I didn't even know this existed. And for no reason at all, I went, yeah, I can probably do that. <laughs> so I just went down there and... I had, at the time, I had, I had purple hair because I just come off of a, a big metal tour and they didn't seem to care, but I did <laughs> have to grow it out. But they, uh, I, I auditioned and then like uh, three or four days later, they go, well, come on in. And so I just started hanging out with now some of the really, uh, the people that became known in the biz, you know, Skip Connolly, Karen Connolly was there, Bill Fahey was there. There was a bunch of the, of the original pioneers, Dan Dennis, and we would, nobody really knew what we were doing. It was the, the whole wild west. And, oh, let's see if that works. Okay. Well, let's see if that works. And it, it all spiraled from there. But, uh, I didn't answer your question. That was where I started. Uh, it was called the Home Shopping Club in okay. Clearwater, Florida. And that would later become, you now know, as uh, Home Shopping Network or HSN. And was that with local when it first started? Yeah. Or did it, go it was right away? cable systems. And you didn't, uh, you, you called in and we would sit, well, I still do, I guess, sit at desks mostly. But you, you'd sit at a desk. You actually took the call and then you wrote down the order. And then whoever called, they, they had two service centers in two different counties, like warehouses. And you would, no, it wasn't a warehouse. It was a, um, uh, uh, like a strip mall, not mm -hmm. like a strip mall. It was a strip mall. And, and you would go in 
And then the uh, the clerks would just bring the stuff up when you gave them your membership number, and then you go, "Yeah, I want that," or "I don't want that," and that's how all this this started. So yeah, it was uh, that was uh, yeah, that's how th this business you know would foster and become you know the the empire on television. But yeah, it was local. Wow. Yeah. And so how did how did it transition from you're selling? I, I guess you were selling all kinds of stuff at the time, right? How did it transition to watches? It I, again, that was something that was just uh, it was right place at right time. Um, I was at the time it would have been called Value Vision, and they had a show that ran four hours starting at midnight. I think it was midnight east, and it was Wednesday night. And you would, it, it, I say you, uh, the, they had this guy that would fly in and sell uh, pocket watches, just one-offs, actual antique pocket watches. And the guy that was hosting it at the time uh, really didn't want the show. He wanted to do other things. And the show was within two weeks of being canceled anyway and blah, 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 blah. blah. All right. So I said, well, I'll take it because I had this interest in watches and I thought, well, you know, it's probably not going to last, but as long as this guy's coming in here, uh, pocket watches are something I didn't know a lot about. I can learn some stuff doing the show, and, and, and uh, let's just do this. So two weeks turned into another two weeks and so on, and then um, we had another guest that came in, and these are still doing one-offs. And then one day he goes, you know, I think I've got like six or seven of this watch. You want to just see what if we can sell multiples? And that worked, and... It, it just kept going and going and going and it, it just kind of blew out from there. But th that's so it, it was literally, I was in the building and they said, you want to host a, a, a watch show? And I, and I had kind of a background in watches as a, as a collector and somebody who studied them. So it was, you know, kind of melded in, I guess. Right. So you always had an infinity for watches. Cause I can, I can, as a kid, I was fascinated with them. You know, oh, so I, I was about to ask you that. So, how did you discover? Because you collect. I mean, how did you, how did you find them? Well, I just I don't know. I was always one of these people that paid attention to adults a lot, and I don't know for whatever reason I was always attracted to to guys or you know older people wearing watches, and it always caught my eye. You know, nothing else did. It wasn't the shoes or clothes or, but a watch always seemed to me to say it just spoke a lot about the person. And it said it says a lot about you. I mean, back in the day, I mean, the younger kids, the younger generation right now, to me, doesn't seem like they are really in the watches. I think it's kind of there's, and you tell me, it seems like they're coming back to it now. It's more of a fashion accessory than it is, uh, you know, a timepiece. But I see a resurgence. I, I don't know. That's my opinion. But for a while there, everybody, when everybody started getting these smartphones, you know, they thought, hey, I can oh, check my time on the phone. I don't need a watch, right? You know, I, I think there's a, a pendulum in the industry that just swings around to the a point where everybody goes, well, that's it for wristwatches. I mean, it happened uh, really quick. I'll just mention this. It happened in, in the 70s with the advent of the quartz technology. Right. And it was offered to the Swiss. The Swiss didn't want it. The Japanese said, oh, we'll run with that. And they did. And then it was this harbinger of doom because, frankly, quartz is more accurate than the mechanical. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that was it, you know, because it was all about the accuracy. But you know what? You know what it missed? It missed the artistry of building like I have on a, a mechanical skeleton here. I mean, it, it, it missed that artistry. And so that survived because the guy that was going to buy the quartz watch in the 70s, you still had the monsters. You had a Longue, Rolex, Patek Philippe, Vacheron, Breguet, uh, a lot of guys I can't name right now. Right. And it, I'm not saying they weren't threatened but they survived because they still built the art and then it came through and it became the status thing so back to your point what you've got going now is there was a time and again you know the advent of the phone and it was like oh that's it now oh they're done for sure and i i say i'll i'll, I'll give myself credit for this I, for the moment i started hearing it no they're not they are not because the phone isn't art now it's wizardry it's ingenious right, right. it's amazing that you carry the world in your pocket but, you know, and it, yeah, it, you can have this connect electronically to an atomic clock and, and whatever. Right, right. What it doesn't do is give you the personality. You can argue, I guess, for case coverage, but it's not the same thing. To your point, right? It's eye-catching. You want to see the watch and so on. Okay. The artistry is coming back because I think the younger generation that, that was supposed to, like, kill the watch um, is starting to realize 
you know what? Everybody's got at least one of these. Some people got like two or three and whatever. And it's not the, you know, the, the, the status thing. It's not special. It's not whatever. But a watch, that's still something you can give as a gift. Like many years ago, you could do it. You could do it now. I mean, they become, all right, no phone is going to be an heirloom. No, no. It's it just not, man. But watches can be, or you can inscribe them, and the and it's the art of the mechanic. I mean, the the reason, like you mentioned, like you you were attracted because you saw, you know, like the people wearing the watch would be eye catching. Um, I was a little different. Um, I actually here's a quick story. I actually found my first mechanical watch. I must have been about five or six. I was actually playing where I wasn't supposed to. I was playing under the YMCA, which I won't elaborate. I don't remember why, and I mean under the building. In this dirt. I don't even know why we were all in there. And I found this buried mechanical watch. I didn't know what it was. And I took it home. And, of course, my parents took it away. Maybe take it back down to the YMCA. I don't know whatever became of it. But I started thinking, that's a little machine. And you could wear it. It could tell time. And you know what? To this moment, it's still the fascination to me. These are machines Mm -hmm. that are also art. And they also impart the passage of time. It, it's a little ingenious device. And I, so there's the fascination. And I think I went off topic there, but I it, tend it to do all, that. But it was all it good. Was all good. <laughs> yeah, good. Awesome. <laughs> so, so let's get – how many, how many watches do you have in your watch, watch collection? Do you even know? Do you, are you a big I collector know. or are you a little bit more selective now? Well, you know what? Actually, I've, I've pretty been much like more selective, I think, than than a lot of people think. Um, there are many guys that I, I converse with via uh, Facebook and and so on, um, and over the years with emails that, that that have collections that dwarf mine for sheer numbers. I mean, these guys have hundreds. Mm-hmm. And for a while, I befriended a, a guy here in the uh, Nashville area that. He claimed it's the largest collection in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't know how to prove or disprove. So I believe him because I've seen, seen it. Small part of it somewhere north of seventeen thousand. Have you seen any portion of it? Oh yeah, yeah. He has. Uh, you know, he's 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 of means for sure. I mean, I was over at one of his properties, and he had a vault down in the in, in this very large basement that is floor to ceiling, just boxes of watches and that was just a very small part of it he actually i think at one point he had actually purchased a uh, uh like a bank building or something that went out of business and he stored his really high-end stuff down there and yeah so i saw some of it but uh, my anyway back to your question there's nothing to do with me um <laughs> see i told you um i, I don't know exactly mm-hmm. um i roughly right now if i had to guess probably between 50 and 60 some, oh, some okay. Because I don't, do you hang on to every, do you still have every watch ever? No. See, I don't either. I will, um, I will amass a certain amount and then I'll go through them. And some of them, I'm not as excited as I used to be and, or I'm not wearing it or whatever. And then I'll very quietly just start moving out of that portion. You know, I'll I'll do it with eBay or something. And I very quietly just get rid of them because I'm going to, flip that and I'm going to get something else. Right. So I'm not the, uh, the, you know, like I've got every single watch ever. Uh, but I, I don't do, this is another question I get is I, I don't do all, all high end or low end. Uh, one of my favorite watches um, to wear, I don't have it in here at the moment. It's a watch that was, uh, I think it was $4. It might've been less than that. If it, it Burger King, if you bought something, I don't remember. And it's Homer Simpson, and if you hit the button, Homer goes, mmm, burger. And it's just this goofy watch, it, because you don't have to spend a ton of money. One of the best pieces of advice, seriously, to, I ever got with watches, this guy named Love Matani. He's also my original mentor. This guy, he still is a major uh, watch dealer. He's in the Caribbean. He he, he handles uh, Paddock Philippe, Vacheron, Breguet. A lot uh, of big names. You know, a lot, just the monsters. And he used to, uh, because I was I was actually uh, doing some uh, promotional work in the Caribbean for a while. And I would sit in his office and he'd go, see, I watched, that's $80,000. And 
Now, here's why that is. And that's real insightful to, uh, to understand why a watch costs what it costs. And as you know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why that's true. But the, 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 the best piece of advice he ever gave me, and this is from a guy that literally has watches in his case for a quarter million dollars. He, he, would, he said, if it's over $50, it ceases to be about time. Right. He's right. I believe that. Yeah. It, it, now you're talking about craftsmanship, material design, uh, mm -hmm. brand prestige. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Right. So uh, and answering your question, maybe 50 or 60 right now, give or take. And to get on that subject back, what you were talking about, you know, pricing and watches mm -hmm. and things. I do have a lot of people that always question me because they see me with a different watch every day. And, you know, some of the watches, they think that I spend way more than I actually do for the watch. But it, for me, it's not about the money. And I always tell people I'm not a watch snob. Right. Do I like the big names? And there's some watches I could never even purchase they're just they'll be out of my price range forever mm -hmm. uh, but there's some that you know that uh, i like and they're not that expensive and i wear them proudly and i'm happy with them so i tell people i'm not a watch knob but i do have some nice watches in my collection but nothing crazy i think i think a big mistake that a big mistake collectors can make is becoming a watch knob oh, you're yeah. really missing out on some very cool stuff you, oh you, yeah you, you should Absolutely. You know, like Absolutely. a watch snob would never wear the Homer Simpson watch. And I'm telling you, that's just this really weird little funky watch. And it's fun. Um, so I've got, you know, anywhere from there on up to some relatively high end stuff, I guess. Uh, it, but but don't don't be a watch snob. Like you probably hit this, too. Um, like I will never own a quartz watch. Well, yeah. you're missing out. Mm -hmm. All right. You can't. Then you don't own a Lunacode, too. Mm -hmm. which is probably one of the coolest watches with a Soprod seven engine movement that you just decided you don't want that. That was, that was majorly cool. Right. Um, yeah, I agree with you. But don't, don't be a watch snob because you're, you're going to miss out on some really great stuff. And if you stumble upon some of these Facebook groups, you know, they, a lot of them just bash certain brands. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just stay away from that because it's like, why, why would you bash something that, you know, because somebody had a bad experience with a customer service rep or something, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. You but know, it, the customer service rep might have had a bad day. Exactly. I mean, you don't, you don't know all the backstory. And, and if, frankly, if there is a, a, a clear pattern, if there's where you could, you can make this out. I have a suggestion. Why don't you just not buy that? But to, yeah. to go that and, you know, start, you know, you know, carrying the sign like I'm going to pick it or something. I mean, I, I don't think that that really doesn't help. I mean, uh, it, it's no secret for the last two years, uh, myself and uh, Mike Davis, we founded uh, talk about watches .com. And one of the, the missions that we have with that is we screen the watches that are on there. Right. And you have so to like them. We actually try to because we, we turn, you know, certain brands away. And sometimes it's due to design. And sometimes I just know that there's going to be well, like mechanical issues or, or, or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think to, to your point, instead of just, you know, joining a group and blathering on it and being negative, if you're going to be negative, do you have a solution? And that's something <laughs> I try to hold myself to. Like if I'm in the recording studio, am I going to start bitching about some guy's recording or am I going to fix it? Do I have a solution? Because if you can't, if you can't offer a solution, then really you're just in there kind of venting, which I guess there's a therapeutic side to that. But uh, what, what, what's the solution? What could be done different or better that makes it better for you? So. And some of these groups go beyond venting. I mean, it's just like venom. It's I mean, the whole, the whole yeah. group is about bashing one brand or two brands. And, you know, you're almost uh, embarrassed to say, well, I own a whole bunch of those brands, you know, that that brand. I, I have a ton of those. And so I kind of just stay away from it, you know. Well, I don't. I, I do it for a little different reason, actually. I, I don't. I, I try to be a really positive person. And, and, and for groups, and you're right, there are literal groups that are, all the, the the reason that these groups exist is just to to go off on this vitriol about a certain brand or whatever. So I I'm not in there just because I don't like that kind of behavior. Um, also, to your point though, uh, another reason that I I don't really give a lot of credence to those groups is, and this is in my personal situation, is I don't concentrate on any single brand. My collection, and, and maybe I, I've 
I've really been kind of shy about showing it. I, I get asked fairly often and I'm not leading anything. I don't have it sitting over here. Uh, <laughs> it's nothing like that. Um, no surprises. No, 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 nothing like that. But it's, you know, one of the ways around that is spread out the collection. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, and, and by, I'm not implying that watches are investment. And that's another thing. Don't treat, don't think of your watches as investments because they're not. And I, even if the individual that sold you that watch, and I know it wasn't me because I've never used the I word, uh, they're not investments. Now, there are some that can go up, but it's not like you're you're trading, a, you know, like stocks or commodities or anything like that. But if you look at my collection, I have anything from uh, Sterling to uh the exoskeleton i i did if anything i'm kind of heavy in exoskeleton generation one and two because they're 904l steel they're hand built very complex cases and they're visually interesting uh i've got a lot of the, the eastern european stuff the russian stuff so i'm in the uh, denisov and i mentioned earlier vostok europe um uh, i've got i think only three or four invictus i've got three or four androids and um, i bet you that one of those invictus is the vault if i'm not if mistaken I'm just, you, you know what? I'm thinking about doing something with that bolt. Here's what I have. Maybe somebody can, I don't know, just, would, would this be of interest? I'm thinking about doing a contest where somebody could win it because I have the bolt that started it all. You sold it to me. I remember that show. Yeah, right? And I it bought that bolt a house for a presentation. And it was the big, they had a watch geeks get together and then they had the show live over at Everett Al's house. Um, I just happened to have the chocolate Zeus and it's the exact piece that I own is the one that was used in all the promo. So for somebody who's really into the Zeus, it would be kind of fun to have the one that started it all. So yeah, mm -hmm. I still, I have, I did hang on to that. I've, it's I've, a cool watch. It needs it's a battery, cool but it's, uh, I have it. Yeah. Cool build. Pretty yeah, big. Oh, it's a cool oh, build. Very. I mean, that, and that's a great example, especially if you're looking at the original stuff where, the, you know, the the uh, the physical work it took to make that case and the melding of the of the cables. It's it's remarkable. It's a very well, cool it was two or three years in development. They didn't even know well, if they yeah, were it was about the three, the market. three serves. I mean, I haven't worked with Invicta officially in a while, but yeah, it, it was like two or three years of R&D. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure they've all made money on it now, but uh, oh yeah, for a while they were in the red just because of the R&D cost. On it. There's probably like ten or twelve different versions of it now. Oh, know, if not more, yeah. Ball. Of course, now they're doing the cables and uh, like I, said, I haven't worked on them for the better part of two years, but uh, yeah, the colored cables and and whatnot are going on. Um, so uh, again, a great tangent, but uh, yeah, my advice is if you're concerned about any, and I don't care what the brand is, concerned about any particular brand. Diversify your collection. Mm -hmm. And another way to, to uh, here's some unsolicited advice, is buy the watch correctly. And I, I know this sounds like promotion, and I guess in a way it is, but one of the ways that we have set up, uh, like what Mike and I do at Talk About Watches, is we make sure that the watches are priced to move the first time. Mm -hmm. And if you'll buy the watch properly the first time, you can at least, you can minimize the, the downside. But I really encourage everybody getting into watches. Don't don't treat watches like like investments. And I, I I've heard people presenting watches. So we go and this is an investment. And I, no, it's not. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, I I have a few watches that have gone up. Like one of the the jewels. If I ever did show my collection, this this is one I would show because I have serial number forty of Quinting, which a lot of people don't even know that brand. Mm -hmm. And actually, I like collecting brands nobody's heard of. So. Right. I, I, I kind of get think that's fun for some reason. But number 40 was hand made by Renee Quinting. And that has significantly gone up since I, I bought it. But I would tell you that I didn't buy that to watch it go up in value. I bought it because I think he's a genius. And, and you like the watch. Yes. And I love the watch. That's exactly right. And so it didn't matter to me if it, if it, if it appreciated or depreciated. It, I love the watch. And I knew I had it priced right at the time, and I and I made a move, and that, that's what I did. So, what's your go-to watch? I mean, what do you go to? What do you wear? Oh, the most um, uh, this is a watch star I've got. I, I actually like this one because it's a mechanical automatic. It's comfortable, looks great, and just goes. Um, another one, the Lunacode Two. Like I said earlier, it needs a battery at the moment, but I love going to the Lunacode Two. Um, if I want to go a little bit higher end, I. 
Let's see, you've got a Maurice Lacroix I really like. That's a uh, kind of a transparent. A beautiful watch. It's really cool. I love that uh, brand. Oh, they're beautiful brands. Yeah, um, beautiful. And, uh, yeah, I'm a big, big, big fan. So I only got one of those. Um, let's see what else. Uh, oh, uh, Denisov. I'm a big fan of some of the uh, the bit of the higher end Russian stuff. So I got a couple Denisovs way back when I was in the shop at home days, which is how I ended up in Nashville. Um, I uh, again, I had the opportunity. I was working with Craig Hester. I had a chance to buy them right, and those are go to. So I, I guess that would be a few of them. We have a question coming in from a viewer right now from Ed Weeks Jr., and he wants to know what's the best starter watch. To buy. That's a great, great question. Um, I, I don't know if Ed, uh, if you can uh, help me out a little bit. I, I'm assuming that's for yourself. Uh, I would need in a in a perfect scenario. I, I need to know a bit more about how you intend the watch. Um, like for example, if you just want to wear it to work, it could be one thing. If you want to do it in sports, it's, um, I'll start with the sports side. Uh, hands down, if you want, and I don't mean a watch that looks sporty, but not really. Uh, one you actually use. And, oh, and this is my other go-to, duh, um, Casio G-Shock, for sure. Uh, that's If I'm doing my uh, photography, like, you know, like this stuff, the really big format stuff I do, um, sometimes I'm out in weather for many hours, all sorts of weather and, and extreme heat and cold and wet and dry. Wet. Okay, G-Shock just laughs at that stuff. So if you want to start a watch that you'll have for many years, just put it on and go get yourself a G-Shock for sure. Uh, something a bit more dressy. Again, uh, it's, it's a great question, but I, I, I'd kind of like to know what what, what your budget is. Um, uh, basic G-Start, uh, G-Start, sorry, uh, start me mechanical and automatics. I like some of the lower in Vostok Europe's. I, I put you into that. Oh, uh, he says for, for his son. Um, yep. I still know I need to know how old your son is. Um, and and all, son, you see where this is going. It suddenly snowballs in the way right. more complex than Ed ever wanted. Um, if you want to get a mechanical automatic, fairly affordable, rock solid customer service, because I want you taken care of, look at Vostok Europe. Uh, and Christopher, you're right. Uh, Casio G Shock is, it, 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 it's just, it, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, but if you want to stay mechanical and mechanical automatic, um, let's say you just really want to get a toe in the water. I don't even want to spend Vostok Europe money. Uh, pick yourself. Uh, I like Sterling. Uh, Sterling has rock solid customer service. Mm -hmm. They have outrageous designs all the way down into classic designs. And I actually own a fair amount of, of Sterling's. I, I became a Sterling fan in the, like 2001, 2002. These guys were the first brand to really bring serious dial work to TV. They're still the only brand that is uh, that brought a, uh, a Swiss Torby on the television. Do you know if Larry Megan is still associated with them? Oh, yeah, very much so. Okay, uh, so talking about like a brand watches, ambassador, right? I'm sorry? He's like a brand ambassador for them. Uh, uh, was I? No, Larry Megan. Oh, Larry, Ambassador for Sterling. Yes. Larry, to my knowledge, is still doing uh, training for them. He handles a lot of the cruise line business and does some training uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, Larry even guested on the Talk About Watches Live once. Yeah, he's a great guy. I've known Larry for he's years. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome, man. For sure. Well, that was some, that was interesting there. Oh. Uh, so let's let's talk about I, I know you re re uh, referenced that beautiful photo in the back. You're a photographer as well. Do you sell photography? Or is it just a hobby for you? It's um, it, it, I, I will I will just be upfront on this. The, the, the stuff I sell is not inexpensive for for most people because it's it's aluminum. Like this piece back here is done in um, that's a two by six uh, done in um in, in uh, high end aluminum. It's mirror polished and then. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a long story, but the the pigment for the photo is actually inside of a resin, so the light comes through it the first time, hits the mirror, comes back out the second time, so that 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 actually kind of glows in a dim light. Um, but yes, I do, and, and people who want to check out my photography, it is uh, templeimagery.com. You can check it out, and you don't have to buy anything. Just go go look at it and hit me up. Uh, anyone who wants to talk, we can if you want. Let's talk photography. If you got questions out there uh, about photography, I'll be happy to answer them. Or if you want to talk about music and the recording business, uh, we can talk about that. Whatever you want. So those pictures are they one-offs? Do you do one? No, they're, they're all limited edition. Um, I 
I do um, art. If somebody wants an artist proof, I do no more than 33, and the regular edition is 333. What was that number again? It, it, if you want an artist proof, it's 33, mm -hmm. and otherwise, any regular edition is 333. 333. Obviously, I like threes. So is that? A, oh, so you pick that number? That's not like a yeah, standard. I just number. made it up. There's no significance of any kind. <laughs> just say I'll just do that. So it seems to me like you've been able to turn a lot of your passions into businesses, right? So a lot of my audience is on, made up of entrepreneurs, yeah. local business owners, attorneys, physicians, and all of these people are always looking to grow their business. So I'm always trying to help people in their business and help them grow and, you know, e-commerce business or whatever it may be. Um I don't know if you know this, but I own a digital marketing agency. So I'm in contact with local businesses all, every day. And so what I try to do is come on this show and get people like you that have a lot of knowledge and have been able to um, to help people, you know, with with uh, with your wisdoms here. So what I'm curious about is all of these passions you have: photography, music, uh, horology. How or what advice would you give somebody? that has these passions that want to convert them over to a money-making venture or turn them into a full-fledged business. Do you have any advice or how did you do that? Well, I still learn something new every day and I'm going to be, be very clear on this. I, uh, I am not a guidance counselor and I'm, I'm not an angel. <laughs> uh, I can tell you from a lot of, uh, scars and, uh, the number one thing I would suggest uh, before you jump off the cliff is make, do a lot of research mm -hmm. and decide if it's really what you want to do. And like, you know, for example, uh, talk about watches just happened uh, when I separated from, from Evine. And I thought, well, there's this following, they love watches and uh, Mike Davis and I had been talking and we thought, you know what, let's just, we just plunged into it. And we discovered that we could be really efficient and, and therefore we could bring prices down and, and, and so on. And it, it's, it's certainly proven to be a great success. And, we, you know, we grow all the time and we work very hard at it. But to your, your point, if somebody is, is if you've got a passion, I don't know, let's say uh, cooking uh, would be an example. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you want to expand that, uh, are you talking about selling like cupcakes? Uh, it, would it be like something you would send through the mail? Is it something you're going to open brick and mortar with? I mean, there's a lot of things to research and, um, you know, you, you kind of brainstorm it over a bottle of wine with a friend and you go, well, oh, it's easy. Well, nah, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, so number one thing I would say is do a lot of research in the area. Um, no, there's Joe from shop NBC. Hey. Thank you, Joe. I, I appreciate you uh, hanging with me all these years. That's nice, man. Um, so I, I, I know that sounds kind of trite or maybe almost obvious, but seriously, uh, doing a lot of homework up front, you can decide this is something I want to keep as a hobby or this is something that I can really make a go of. Um, let's, uh, you know, I'll give you two quick examples. The reason that, that photography exists now as a business for me is I had – it was never my intent to to make it a business. Um, I shoot because I love to shoot. Mm -hmm. And I've been very blessed in the sense that I can pick and choose who I work with and uh, the places that I would go. I would go just to, to shoot. And I would just take the time and, and, and create. But people started asking when they see the work, can I buy that? And I had enough people ask. It was like, well, you know what? I think I'm going to arrange where you can buy that. And well, so that's, that's, cool. that's how it started. Um, mm -hmm. If you're in like my little scenario with, with cooking, you know, if you've got enough people that have complimented you, do you think they would pay you? And, and just do polls. Start with your friends and friends of friends. And then if you really think that that's rock solid, then maybe it's time you, you take a serious uh, serious look at it. So uh, hopefully that's of, uh, of some help. I encourage entrepreneurship, by the way. But I will tell you this, um, it's scary. Mm -hmm. It's scary, but when it hits, there is no greater high. Oh yeah, it's to to. Uh, I work harder now, and, and in, in fairness, I do own more than one business. But it's I'm 
so I, I do a lot every day. Um, I rarely get a day off, but there's a real difference when you're working for yourself mm-hmm. and you're working with people that you respect and you're working with with products and with concepts that you love. That it it it, it was such a you know it's a time worn adage that you know if you work for yourself you i'm paraphrasing i think it's if you something to the effect of if you work for yourself you'll never work a day in your life or something to that effect i kind of disagree with that i'm well aware i'm keenly aware i'm working but there is a rush to it you know if i was doing those huge days seven days a week for somebody else and eh, and uh, into that so much um so yeah i guess that's the single biggest piece of advice i hope that helps somebody no, that was great, that was great, that was great advice, advice. So, so what is your primary, primary focus, or do you have just an equal balance, balance of all of your projects you've got going on? Uh, that, that's a great question. First of all, there, there, it's not an equal balance. Um, any one of them can step up at, at any time. Uh, right now, um, honestly, photography is kind of on the back burner mm-hmm. because uh, Talk About Watches has taken off so big. That for those of you who don't know, it's talkaboutwatches.com. .com. So you can go and to the still, if, you, if you haven't checked it out, um, in fact, let me let me uh, do a little caveat. I promise I'll come back and talk about it. The, the okay. answer. Um, anyone who wants to check it out, uh, Bob's going to post a link, and if it's not there now, it'll be up in a, in a replay. You guys should get on the talkaboutwatches.com mailing list, and I'll, I'll give you a, two good reasons right now. First of all, we just today opened a a, a contest. And you'll see it if you go to talkaboutwatches.com. And in case, because I don't know if Mike put it there yet, but if you go to the Facebook page for talkaboutwatches.com, you can't escape it. And the point is we're giving away an Alexander Valjeu 7750. Somebody's going to win it just for getting on the list. That's awesome. Okay, but let's make this even better. And I only got this okay late today. And it technically is still not okay, but I'm going to go on a limb with this. Anyone who gets on this list is going to get, and let me be clear, there, there, there is no catch. There is no cost. We're asking you to buy nothing. Uh, you're going to be entered for, somebody's going to win the Value 7750 by Alexander. I think that's a uh, list on it's close to $1,500. We're going to give that away, but that's not where I was going. Everyone who gets on this list, just get on the list. You are going to get a subscription to About Time magazine. That's a great magazine. Yeah, it is. And you're going to get four issues. But check this out. So the I, I know the the uh, the the uh, chief the editor in chief of About Time. Anyone who comes through TAW and gets on that list, you're going to get access to the full archive of past issues. Wow. Yeah, that is a wow. Because that to get a past issue depends on the issue. It runs anywhere from I think he said it runs anywhere from seven dollars to twenty dollars. You will have access to the entire archive, and this is all at no cost. You just have to be on the email list. Well, believe me, you guys. For everybody that tuned in tonight, you guys are lucky. I'm going to go ahead and post this in the replay. Please do. I'll I'll put the link up there. Uh, and I encourage you to go ahead and, and, and click on it and try to, when are you going to give it away? Do you have a date yet or the actual watch is going to be given away in roughly two weeks? I think a What's little, the value of that watch, Tim? do you have a value of that watch? It's roughly about $1,500. It, exact, somebody wants to look it up. You can go to the Alexander website. I think it's 1400 and change. I think, uh, but it, it's the Alexander Olin, O L Y N. And I know I should know this. I think it's a little over $1,400, 14 or 50 So right around in there, I'm really sure. For a Baoju 7750. Yeah. And it's on a solid link bracelet. It's black with uh, midnight blue metal. It's it's gorgeous. Beautiful watch. Okay. So we'll make sure to – so everybody that's watching, please hit hashtag replay. Okay. I yeah. want you to hashtag replay because I see a lot of you all are on here. But I need you to hashtag replay so we can get this out to as many people as possible and like and share this because uh, I want people to take advantage of this wonderful offer that Tim and his crew are doing. Uh, I think that's fantastic, Tim. Thank you for doing well, thanks, that. Thanks, man. I, uh, I, I, really, uh, I really appreciate it. 
Um, and I appreciate getting getting the word out. And again, seriously, uh, obviously only one person is going to win that Valjou, but it might be you. But even if it's not, everyone who gets on that list, seriously, is going to get the subscription to About Time magazine, four issues, digital version, and full access to the past issues. And all awesome. you have to do is be on the list. There, there is no catch. You're not going to get a bill. There's nothing like that. It, it, so it's just uh, uh, I, I knew the guys at About Time, and they, they hooked a brother up. I mean, that's really it. Uh, <laughs> Gus has a question, and then I'll, I'll come back. Uh, black and gold watch it as eye-friendly, something with big numbers. Because um, he can't see anymore. Well, this one's uh, black and gold, but it doesn't have numbers. But that's the watch star that it's got the big, uh, uh, like pads that are luminous. Uh, black and gold with big, probably numbers. moving up in millimeters too would help. With yeah, uh, for sure. You want the bigger watch numbers again, on there? Off the top of my head, uh, check out Sterling. Mm -hmm. uh, they do some really cool black and gold stuff. Uh, VE, Vostok Europe does some pretty cool stuff. And a lot of this stuff you have on your talkaboutwatches.com oh, yeah. website, right, Tim? Yeah, you can get it from – then there's other uh, sources, of course. But, yeah, obviously I favor talk about. I will say this. Uh, talk about watches. I can't say always. Nobody can say always. No. But more often than not, talk about watches has the lowest price in the United States. We always try to do that. Now, sometimes we can't. But you're always going to be ultra competitive, and we're very often the best price out there. So uh, Sterling, we carry uh, exoskeleton. You know what? We carry a couple of black and gold exoskeletons right now, but the numbers on them aren't that big, to be honest. Uh, VE would be a good. Uh, oh, uh, CT Scuderia. I don't know really what your price range is. CT Scuderia, we're going to be doing a show with them this coming Tuesday night. What does what their price point, point start at on that brand? I missed the question. What What is a price point on that brand? CT Scuderia. Uh, starts, they start at about 1200 and go to about 3000 But, but remember, I talked about buying it right. right. Tuesday night, 9 p.m. East, Facebook Live or YouTube Live, we're going to have all the C2 scooteries that we can get at half off. And right. that's buying the watch right. And if everybody uh, joins, mailing I'm say again. Yeah, if, and if everybody joins that mailing list with that link we're going to put out there, they'll get notifications as of well. Course. Yeah, we'll keep you guys. Oh, and by the way, we also do deals of the day. Uh, so you're going to get that. Uh, you're obligated to do nothing. And we don't spam either. Somebody goes, are well, you going to spam me? No. We only send one email a day. And you don't share your, their emails no, with anyone we else? We never share. We never sell the list. And so you're, you're very safe. And uh seriously to get that subscription there's no reason you guys shouldn't sign up and there's other ways you if you want to share the link and i hope you do uh, put in multiple entries for you if you'll just do that so somebody's going to get a you know a really cool watch and then uh, everybody gets the subscription and uh, now i'm going to come back and let's talk about uh you mentioned like uh, like is everything equal in since multiple businesses no uh, my photography is at the back right now just because taw has blown up uh, so uh, it's between that and then I'm if I'm working in Black Rabbit Nashville, uh, which I now specialize. All I do is uh, is mixing and and I'm also a keyboardist and arranger. So um, I will do some string section arranging and stuff like that. But I don't always record there. Vocals I do record. The point is that it, it's kind of specialized, and that's something else I really have a passion. There's something when you really got that mix happening and you can just feel it and you got that groove going, it, it's, it, it's amazing. And so I, I usually start my day with that because the ears are really fresh. So right. I'll be at Black Rabbit Nashville, and then I move from there, and then I spend the whole rest of the day and sometimes well into the evening working with Talk About Watches. That's what I do. So you are a busy, busy man. So that's your typical day, huh? Go to the studio almost every day. Um, not every day, but almost every day. Well, the first thing is coffee. I'm a big fan of cold brew coffee. So I, I start with that. And then um, right now I've actually got a uh, remix and remaster project uh, for uh, Carl Swartz, who's just a, a fantastic guy. He's a monster uh, fusion uh, guitar player. So I'm in the middle of remixing and remastering uh, his first two CDs. So I'm keeping real busy with that. So the thing about the mixing, though, is it, it, it kind of works out really well for this because uh, I find that 
people are just starting to get into recording, you get into mixing and you're around studios a lot. Uh, you don't want to do that for too long because the ears just tire out and you're going to start making bad decisions. So I do that for a little while and then, okay, now talk about watches and we just put it away. And now we're going to go out and figure out what's the cool watch. How can we make this deal work? How can we make the customers happy? We're really big on customer service and that, that takes up that. So that's my day. You know, I'll start with, uh, uh, sometimes not, sometimes it's all talk about watches all the time. But uh, if you've got a gig down there, I do uh, Black Rabbit Nashville and then come back to the studio uh, and get uh, TAW underway. That's what I and do. I did, and I did see you do a stint. You came back with Croton for a little while on Evine. I did. And then, uh, and then I, I never saw you again on there. Yeah, uh, the the Merm. Yeah, David Mermelstein and I, we got the better part of 20 years. We've been working together on and off. And David is a, a, a very hard, hardworking guy. He's a, a really solid friend over the years and builds a great product. And yeah, he asked me to uh, to do it. And I said, yeah, I'd, I'd be really into it. So I got to do a, a couple of shows. And then uh, without getting too much into it, uh, uh, Evine decided that uh, they, they didn't want me to do that. And uh, so then I didn't. <laughs> That's basically it. So that was fast and in and out. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> how, did, how did it feel going back into the Evine Studios? I mean, I thought it was going to be long term. It looked like it. That was our goal. You know, when David and I talked, it's like, yeah, let's do this. It'd be. It, it, here's the thing: I'd never literally worked with David as a partner. I'd always worked with him, where I would host a show, and and then you know the Merm would come in and, and would guest, and we just hit it off. And I've had uh, different members of his team on various shows. I mean, he not he, but uh, members of his team did uh, shop at home with me. They did JTV with me. And so I've just known them, but but to actually say, you know what, let's be on uh, literally on the same team. We had every intent to do it uh, long term, so I'm, I'm I was sad it didn't work out, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, well, for those of you who don't know, uh, David Mermelstein is the owner of Croton Watches. Yeah, Croton Watches, the Merm, as the he Merm, is known, what everybody calls him, aficionados, and a great guy. I hope you guys get to meet him sometime. He is one of the most. Uh, just genuine, warm people you'll 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 meet, and, and that comes across on screen. Yeah, when he's on, it does come across. He doesn't. Uh, he's less loud. In oh, person. is he? Yeah, he the, he gets. Uh, if you really turn the merm loose on the show, it was like it was really an easy gig because if I had the merm, uh, you knew you weren't going to talk a whole lot. <laughs> And so you just try to keep everything else in check and just turning loose. And uh, but if you meet him, he's not nearly that loud. He's very gracious and uh, he's a very interesting guy to talk to. So if you guys meet him, so let's uh, let's break up your music career and yeah. your you can you can talk about your photography. But what's been the highlight of these three careers? I guess what where have you like? Who, did you get wow. to perform with anybody really big? Did yeah. You, what, who who what stands out when I say that? I what pops in your head? I, I won't do too much uh, detail because it usually ends up with a, a, a ton of people asking more questions. Um, the highlight I've had several highlights musically. Uh, I'll mention one was live and one was in the studio, and I'm actually under an NDA where I can't say the literal name. But okay, I'll, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, I appeared with Kansas. I got to work with Kansas at the Orpheum Theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's pretty cool. That was very cool because mm -hmm. Steve Walsh is one of my vocal idols. Uh, and by the way, uh, Kansas, because I got a whole soapbox thing I do about this. Uh, <laughs> Kansas is this whole digital, which I'm all digital. Black Rabbit is all digital all the time. But digital technology has arrived to the point where, uh, and unfortunately it's not everybody, but it, it's very often, well, not very, but it's often that the artist, in bunny quotes, they're hired because of their personality or how they look, mm -hmm. because you're going to fix it in the mix. And it doesn't really matter if they sing all that well, and you don't really care if they write, and you don't really have to play. I mean, we're actually literally in an era where the music industry doesn't care if you can sing or play. That's kind of bizarre, but here we are. What but, about that, EM, well, uh, that EDM that's going on now where these guys are getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to show up to put press a button and play a MP3 
three or MP4. Or, I, mean, I don't get. Yeah, this whole I obsession with DJs. Uh, yeah. you know, by the way, I'm not knocking DJs. You, right. you guys, you know, at the club, rock it out, whatever. But now people are actually going like to concert venues to hear a guy play records. Yeah. I, I just that's odd to me. I, I, but you know, let's. Uh, I can get off on that tangent too if you want. <laughs> But uh, digital has uh, it literally. We've arrived at a place where people don't have to play and sing to 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 be a, a recording artist, and that's odd. But Steve Walsh, by the way, Steve Walsh, for those of you who don't know, is the lead voice of Kansas. Um, he's the original, and now he's back with him. He was gone for a while, but now he's back. First tenor, unbelievable range. The point is, one of the highlights, besides being on stage with him, was getting to uh, hear him warm up backstage, which I didn't anticipate all of a sudden you just hear him start this is a guy there, there's going to be no pitch correction there's no auto tune this guy has just he's just got the pipes i mean it's the the you know the, where the mount olympus bestowed this voice on this individual and yeah that that was a highlight for sure working with them um highlight in the studio um I've gotten to record with some pretty cool people. Um, I'm on uh, both of the Carl Swartz CDs. Uh, but right now, I am doing a – it's a remix, and I'm not allowed to tell you the – I can tell you this. It's one of the biggest British supergroups of all time. Hmm. I'll say that, and then I'll leave it. That's but I'm it, doing a, a, a remix on, on some of their classics, and I was absolutely – when I got the call – that uh, we have these tracks. I thought they were messing with me, but they weren't. And it's uh, it's awesome. So that's a highlight for, for music. Um, photography, there, it, it's, uh, I gotta say it's, it's numerous. Um, wow. If I had to pick a single, I don't, I don't know that I can. Um, Sunrise in the Southwest United States is, is right up there. Um, at, in, in Arches National Park, I have some really beautiful stuff out of that. Um, I shot uh, the uh, Incan ruins at Machu Picchu. Um, that was a highlight. The uh, uh, the ruins of um, oh, I can't even think of uh, Abu Simbel in uh, Egypt was a highlight because uh, I've I've been really oh Antarctica. What am I thinking? Yeah, if I had to pick a single highlight, I shot Antarctica in uh, late uh, two thousand four, and uh, that would be. Um, that that's other literally another world. So I I know I'm bouncing all over the place, but I I don't have this one shot where that was it. Um, the one I'm most famous for, I guess it's a highlight. It's called the Spirit of the Light. Um, I'll send you a, a, a JPEG of it later, but it it looks like a human form that's inside of a light beam that was in a time exposure that was in Antelope Canyon in uh, Arizona. Yeah, I'd like to, yeah, see, I'd like that. to see that. Really weird. And I got uh, kind of famous for that one for a while. But uh, but to see the thing, you call that a highlight. I guess career-wise it's a highlight. But at the time, you don't see it. Right. You know, and I wasn't even the only one shooting there. There's maybe 15 of us that were shooting there mm -hmm. and or more. And I just happened in my exposure in that exact moment happened again. And that's part of the magic to me of photography is these little clips of time. It's really cool. It's like... Um, in fact, I was out shooting with, uh, I mentioned earlier, Craig Hester, he handles Vostok here and so on. I was shooting uh, New England fall foliage, and he lives in New England, so I hung out with him for a bit. And I was showing him the difference of what magic light is, because there's certain times of the day where the light is magic, and the rest of it isn't. And I remember he called me like two days later. He said, hey, man, I went by that place. Yeah, it just looks like nothing now. Yeah, but it was magic when we were there because you have to be there. Yeah, and uh, being a, a lot to me because I'm a natural light photographer. I don't use strobes at all, even if I'm shooting portraits. I don't. I don't use strobes. So knowing light and knowing how to manipulate it in post production is it's a pretty big deal for that. So there's that. Um, let's see. Uh, in you have, uh, uh, you have Gus on here. He's uh, guessing yeah. the stones. Uh, I cannot confirm nor deny, actually. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not, I, I guess I am sort of being coy about it, but I, even if you said it, I, I wouldn't be able to go, that's it. Um, the good news is you'll be able to come back on the show and reveal it. 
Yeah, maybe we can work that out. Yeah, if I get through with some tremendous legal hurdles. And uh, honestly, I don't even know if the if the project at the end of it all, if it's going to get approved. But it, the highlight is being, it, it's something about a band that unbelievably famous and you're in your own studio and you bring up those sliders and the original tracks come out of the monitors. Hey, that's just that's the rush, and if it happens to lead to something really cool, I'd, I'd be all into it. But uh, we'll we'll see. It sounds um, really cool. It is, man. It, it's it, it's, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't tell tell more. But in answer to a direct question, that's a, that's a current highlight. Um, video retail, uh, boy, highlights. Um, working with the uh, the guy that invented the Casio G Shock, he came on the show once. That was a highlight. Um, I was the third guy in the industry, and it, it was in very rapid succession. Uh, the first ever to, to do a, a million dollar show. Uh, the first was a guy named Mark Brown, followed by Dan Dennis, and I was the third. So well, you, I was sold, you sold you sold a million dollars worth of product in one show in a single show. And how and long was the show? Three-hour block? Yeah, that's a three-hour block. I would have been the first to ever do a million-dollar hour. Uh, we were selling, this is back in the Cable Value Network days, um, we were selling two computers simultaneously. And somebody, one of the buyers, I don't remember who, but basically somebody suddenly panicked and pulled everything down. They weren't. They were afraid they couldn't fill all the orders. And so it fell shy of the mill. I, and I'm quite certain somebody at HSN or QVC or whatever has long done a million dollar hour. It's probably not that big. Deal. But in the 80s, that had never been heard of. And so I almost got to do that. So I guess technically it's not a highlight if I didn't do it. Um, what else? Um, I was I, I did the uh, I did the first Invictor. Actually, I did about 30 Invictor remotes, but doing the very first one. With the big watch geeks get together, that was a highlight. That was yeah, pretty. That was fun. Pretty badass. Yeah, I mean they have some rabbit fans, the Invicta fans, right? Uh, I'm sorry, say again. You have a lot of rabbit Invicta fans out there. Well, they are Invicta fans. I was just talking. Actually, I was just talking to About Time Magazine about them today. I mean, they are there. There are two brands that I can name that were the. Uh, uh, let's leave the ultra high end out of it. That that the fans are just rabbit. Uh, Invicta certainly one of them. Uh, without a doubt. And to meet at, at a Watch Geeks uh, get together like that and to meet several hundred of them and just to hang out and talk watches, that was a total, just a rush. The other brand for the record, which actually the fan base is nowhere as large, but is even more rabid, is Exoskeleton. Hmm. That is the probably the single most rabid fan base, especially for Gen 1 and Gen 2. That I, they're if you can believe it, they're more rabid than uh, than Invicta. But Invicta certainly larger. Uh, they they're the uh, they're the powerhouses. No, and no they're doubt. very avant garde pieces, aren't they? Or they used they're, to? Be? Yeah. You know, now that I've gotten all into it, I mean, Watchstar is actually related to them, but uh, especially Generation Two, they started coming out with a superlative star that has the stones that float in the O ring, and um, uh, the Intercontinental has the 15 link bracelet. You know this crazy stuff. The I, I'm friends with the, uh, the the person that invented uh, exoskeleton. Uh, it and uh, they're they're recluse. They're hard to get to know, but it's worth your trouble to do it because they're amazing. Uh, they invented. They hold so many patents. They, they invented uh, glass for Boeing. And they invented, uh, if you've ever been in a BMW at night, how it kind of glows red-orange, they invented that. That's and, cool. yeah, it is really cool. Uh, they uh, What else? There's some LED technology. So, yeah, there's some, some really cool stuff going on. So and talk yeah. about watches carries exoskeleton. Your website, your website carries exoskeleton. Oh, yeah. yeah, we do. And, actually, um, you talk about buying watches right. We carry right now some Generation 2s that are made of 904L steel, and that's the uh, the steel that Rolex uses. You should grab all of those because all the Gen 2s that we carry are factory direct. And to my knowledge, we're the only place right now you can get factory direct. We're actually uh, – we have we work so closely with Exoskeleton. We're actually a, uh, a registered uh, retailer for them. And pretty much to my knowledge, anywhere else, if you want a Gen 1 or a Gen 2, 
uh, they're going to be pre-owned. That's not necessarily bad, but right. they, you know, they are going to be pre-owned for better or worse. But ours are literally factory direct out of the vault. So if you want to check out Exoskeleton, check out TalkAboutWatches.com, and uh, they're they're not for everybody. But that's kind of the point because you're right; they're really avant-garde. Mm -hmm. And I love them. I think it's really cool. But, you know, if your, your taste is uniquely Edwardian, yeah, probably, you know, mm -hmm. not so much. And that's okay. They're flashy. But yeah. They're nice. <laughs> uh, what else do you want to know? So do you have any big projects coming up? What's on the horizon? What can people look forward to? I know the show. How often do you air it? Uh, so these people know here. Yeah, okay. Well, I'd love for everybody to tune in. Uh, it's every Tuesday evening, 9 p.m. East, 6 p.m. out on the West, and it's on uh, – it's called TAW Live or T-A-W Live. You can watch it on Facebook Live, and uh, now we broadcast on multiple pages, so you can see it on the Talk About Watches page, or you can see it on my personal page, Tim Temple. Uh, and for those of you who either don't want to mess with that or you don't like Facebook, because now there's a growing contingent, oh, I hate Facebook, uh, go to uh, YouTube <laughs> because we are YouTube Live. And we just started that last week. And uh, by the way, when you sign up for the, uh, which I hope you are all doing, when you sign up for that uh, new, the, well, not newsletter, for our email list, um, you will have an opportunity for five additional free entries if you just like. Our, uh, our YouTube channel. There's all sorts of ways to get multiple entries, and that's one of them. So if you don't want to mess with Facebook, just go to the Talk About Watches YouTube channel. And this is all free, of course. And uh, also that way, for those of you who want it up on your, uh, on your uh, smart TVs, you can now watch us on the big screen. So it's 9 p.m. East every Tuesday evening, and then, of course, uh, it goes into, into repeat, much like your show does. So it turns into VOD and... Uh, it's really cool. So projects coming up. Let's see. Yes. Um, CT Scuderia, which is a high end, uh, relatively high end uh, Italian brand will be this Tuesday. And I'm, I'm letting the cat out of the bag. I was planning on not announcing it till this weekend. But uh, CT Scuderia through TAW exclusive lowest price in the country. Half off. For so you, that you heard it here first on the Q&A show. Yeah, right. Temple. Temple. There you go. So that'll be half off. Um, we are working on the first ever uh, TAW remote. That sounds that cool. Sounds cool. You know that is going to be cool. It looks like um, it looks like we're going to be shooting. Uh, we're waiting for the final okay, but it's uh, going to be shot. Uh, the working title is the uh, Talk About Watches Riverside Edifice. Okay. So we're uh, we're going to work on that. Well, make sure you keep me posted and all of that oh, stuff sure. so I can get it out to my community. Yeah, I will. Uh, thank you. And I, I certainly uh, will do that. Um, looking ahead, we are working. The deal isn't done. So I don't want to announce this and be wrong. And this is one I actually could announce. And I, but if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll feel really bad. Uh, we are working on a an ultra high end brand, but not gray market. We're working. I've known the guy that builds these for a long time. And. Uh, we're fairly friendly, and I'm like 90% there that he's going to do the show. And that means that you guys will get unprecedented access and price breaks on one of the finest handmade watches out there. And I'm very excited at the prospect of that. So, yeah, we got some pretty cool stuff uh, in That's the – intriguing in to me, Tim. I'm sorry? That's intriguing to me. Oh, good. Yeah, you'll love the show. It's yeah. a, um, it, it's a, he is, because here's a, it's one of my many things I love getting on soapboxes about. Stop calling everyone genius. <laughs> everyone is not a genius. Just because you have a dance record does not make you a genius. Right. You know, this guy is actually a genius. This guy figured out mechanically how to, he reinvented how to present the passage of time. It's, I'm sort of giving hints here, I guess, but uh, like his watches don't have conventional hands on them. Hmm. Uh, one of them uses a pendulum. I mean, it's, just, it's crazy. This, this guy comes up with it, you know? Um, this guy is a genius, and uh, he's uh, also one of the nicest guys you'll ever ever meet, and uh, I'm hoping to get him in a QA and a and maybe I'll hook him up with you, speaking of which, and, and try, to, uh, try to do that. Um, apparently, uh, 
Robbie just thinks something uh, happened that was really funny. <laughs> what he was. He said, like, uh, everybody is not a genius. Yeah, but no. they're not. Yeah. Seriously, they're not. Just because you made a dance album, you're not a genius. <laughs> Um, it's so horribly misused, and, and of course, then you can parse well who you know. I, I'll give you a, a genius. Uh, you know who's a genius? Uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Mm -hmm. That man was a genius. Michelangelo, uh, arguably, right? Nikolai Tesla was a genius. Mm -hmm. The guy that made the dance album, not 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 so much, not really. So much, right? uh, Abraham Louis Breguet was a genius. <laughs> now, I can name some geniuses. Uh, just. That's that's about it. I, 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 totally, I totally agree with you. Not, there deeper. are musical genius. I think Rachmaninoff was a genius. Uh, Mozart, of course. I think a lot of the classical guys were right up there. Um, uh, before, uh, Keith Keith Emerson, I think, was an absolutely brilliant keyboard player. Um, they're, they're certainly, I mean, for sheer writing, I think some of Billy Joel's stuff. I, I'm not calling him a genius, but I think his writing is is brilliant. Uh Eddie Van Halen reinvented the electric guitar. Jimi Hendrix forged new ground. Uh, There's certainly guys that have made monumental advances. Uh, Les Paul creating the uh, multi-track recording system. For me, um, yeah. and this is not everybody's taste in music, but I think Prince was just, to me, he was a genius. The guy could right. play. Well, that's a great example, right? Where this guy did absolutely ingenious everything. Uh, work. I, I met him once, actually. I recorded in Paisley Park. I worked oh, on a movie. Yeah. I was out there for two weeks. and uh, It was a very brief meeting, and I'm not implying I was like hanging out with Prince. That didn't happen. Um, I met him. Uh, actually, uh, it's a very, very nice facility, and they have a, an atrium, and then off the side, he has his uh, kitchen where he had his chef and so on. And I just kept my lunches and stuff in there, and I was going in, and lo and Prince was in there. And uh, I said, Hi. You know, what do you say? And uh, Prince goes, uh, hey, how you doing? <laughs> that was it. That's my Prince story. That but sounded I, more I, like a Michael Jackson, Tim. That yeah. was... Actually, he's got a little lower voice than that. Right, right. Right. It's kind of this gravel. Um, and his vocal range is incredible. Um, no, I never met Michael. Uh, most famous person I ever met, though, was a musician, Robert Plant. Wow. Met Robert Plant. That's huge. Yeah, that was... Uh, and you know what? He is one of the most... The the nicest, uh, you know, when it, you know, it's a front man for Led Zeppelin. Yeah. What what are you going to get? You know, you don't know. And it was purely by accident. It wasn't like it wasn't in a studio with him. It was nothing like that. It was pure happenstance. And um, that he was one of the most just gracious, nicest people. And I uh, I've always remembered that uh, because he had license to go the other way because he's so incredibly successful. And, and he, he doesn't, he, he was very, very nice. Uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, a brilliant player. Um, Gus is getting into the game. Uh, we're going to, oh, like guys that can play really well. I don't, <laughs> yeah. Stevie Ray, a great player. No doubt. No doubt. Well, you know, in, in my opinion, I just don't think there's very many musical genius or icons alive anymore. There's very few. I feel like we're losing so many of them in the last few years. I mean, there's yeah. a handful. You name one of them, like Robert Plant, but we we're talking about, we mentioned Prince, Michael Jackson. They're all gone. There's only a handful left. And um, I don't know. I mean, that I mean, there's one, like one of my original idols, and he's still a big influence for me, is Elton John. Uh, yeah. I've never met him. Um, ironically, someone I went to school with became his florist. That's my collection of my kind of Elton. I never met him. I'd like to sometime. Right. Um, Elton, honestly, I don't like his new stuff. I, I just don't. I'm just being really honest. I kind of wish that he would go the Billy Joel route. Mm -hmm. I love it. Like most of Billy's early work, I'm a huge fan. I don't like the Christy Brinkley era much at all. But you right. know what? When Billy got done, he just stopped. Mm-hmm. He hasn't recorded in 20 years because, and he says this, he goes, I have nothing further at this point I want to say. And Elton just keeps doing it. And I just don't like his stuff, but it, but you talk about, it, I just did on Facebook. I just did like the top 10 most influential albums. And I, uh, I got challenged to do that. And uh, both he and, and Billy are, are on, on the list, but for their, their, their early work. Um, but you're right. And I have, I'm going to come back to my soapbox. You started earlier. Okay. And one of the reasons I think we don't get 
and let me preface this by saying, I think there are musical geniuses out there. I don't think that the percentage is the same as it was in the 70s and the 60s and the 40s and, and the 90s and, and all these great, you think of the, the monsters that, that recorded. The industry doesn't necessarily want that anymore. Hmm. The, industri- the industry, and this is, to be clear, this is my opinion now. Okay. I think the industry now sells uh, CD covers and album covers. They want the male and female models. Mm-hmm. And then oh, if you can't really sing, eh, well, I mean, we'll fix it in post. Get into it. And one of the, the earliest K, this is not hard, this is hardly proprietary. Millie Vanilli was signed uh, because they look like male models. Mm-hmm. And then they had other people sing for them mm-hmm. and tried to get away with it. They won a Grammy. Yes. That, that is one of my favorite soapboxes. This is an album that is literally fraudulent. Right. That was right. awarded a Grammy. The guys that took the Grammy, and by the way, I disagree with it, Grant. I thought that album sucked. But that's not <laughs> the point. Um, the hey, point Tim, is, I, the guys saw that, I saw them in concert in Houston in eight nights. Did you really? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't just them. There was a whole bunch of people on the bill. But they were one of them, and the, the record actually skipped. Okay? Oh, that's they had, awesome, They had to dude. run off stage because – Oh, the, the is that the famous clip that's on – were you at the famous clip that's on YouTube? No, I was in Houston at the Astrodome, and it skipped, and they didn't know what to do, and they kind of looked at each other and just ran off stage. They did that. It's a famous clip on YouTube. They did yeah. the exact same thing. Where, where yeah, the, I think it happened the, to them a few times. Yeah, well, what, what else are you going to do? Well, I guess you can learn to sing. And if you yeah. can't sing, then maybe you shouldn't record an album. But I held it up because that, that I also hold the industry at fault because you can't tell me no one knew. Oh, no. Really? Nobody knew. Everyone Nobody knew. knew that the Grammy was going to two guys that literally aren't on the album. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, what else? Um CNC Music Factory. Actually, I thought their one hit was like really catchy, and if I was a DJ, it'd be kind of interesting. Right. Um, but they they had uh, guest singers on that, and they tried to not credit them. And uh, the, yeah, the they the had models lip syncing in their videos. Yeah, right. And then right. that whole thing came back. Well, we just hired female models for that. Yeah, the uh, the actual vocalists were called Two Tons of Fun, and you that's know, right. Amazing. But why can't you just do that? You know, and but I, I really think now that because they're selling, it's all the look. I mean, think about really think about it. And some of you already have. When's the last time? What era other than this? Every single musician is ridiculously good looking. <laughs> all of them. And here's the other thing. They all sound the same. Yeah. In fact, I, uh, a great friend of mine, uh, uh, Michael Torak, he's the uh, uh, one of the founders and lead guitarists for Impaler, and I've mixed a couple of their pieces. And uh, if you don't know, Impaler is one of the uh, bands that did uh, shock rock, and you all heard of them. I'll tell you where. Tipper Gore, in front of Congress, held up that album and demanded that the government protect the children. Mm-hmm. That was the Impaler album. Right. That well, and, the, and the Purple Rain album. An album. That and was, it was awesome. It was that in the Purple Rain album for Prince's song, Darling Nikki. Yep. That that she used. Those two artists. You know, yeah. I, I got to tell you, I'm a small government guy. I'm not going to get into the politics. I, in fact, I rarely do politics at all because you invariably just piss off half the country. So right. I, I don't do it at all. But the other half loves you. The other half's mad at yeah, you. Yeah, the other one half is really right on. The other, well, I'm not going to do anything <laughs> So I just don't, I don't get involved at all. But uh, yeah, my claim with uh, Congress is that Tipper Gore did hold up my friend's album, but he and I have talked about this. Let me give you a real time example where I can, and let me at least defend my, my position on this, which is if you listen to, let's just take the seventies. If I play you the first few bars of any track on Boston one, you will tell me what band that is. If I play you anything from Queen, you will tell me what band, just for a few seconds. Two I'm riffs. Just, oh. Two or three riffs. Because Queen sounds different than Boston. Mm-hmm. That sounds different than Led Zeppelin, than 
does then sounds uh, Jimi Hendrix, then sounds Eddie Van Halen. Right. Everybody had but, their own sound. But you drop the needle now? I can't tell you who it is, and neither can you. Unless you happen to literally know the album. You don't drop the needle now, Tim. You push the button. Yes. There's no more needles. That's that's a good reference right there. (laughs) Push the button. In fact, it has gotten, in fact, it's in the recording biz. And again, I I own a a studio. Um, It's called On the Grid. Now, for those of you who don't know what On the Grid means is that your tracks were recorded very likely to an electronic grid. Let's say, and I'm just going to make this up. Let's say you uh, record it at 120 beats a minute. Then when it arrives to me to mix it, I'm told this is 120 beats a minute. And then I set up my system so that it reads 120. Now, what I don't like to do, and I rarely do this for the record, is what's called quantize. And sometimes even the recording engineer will do this. And that means you tell the computer to make everything perfect. Or certain sections perfect, and this has gotten it. It started, I'm sure, with with really good thought, you know, like 20, 30 years ago. But now, I once and I I, I actually left. I attended a, a a seminar in Nashville where the instruction was how to take different syllables from different takes and make the word that you want. Hmm. That's how extreme it's gotten now. Yeah. And it's become really homogenized. There's a, a clip on YouTube. I don't know the name. You guys look it up. They took six new country tracks and stacked them one on top of the other. And so you watch the video and they'll show which one's live. But they start interchanging the voice, the lead guitar, the drums. And they're so perfect that six completely unrelated tracks are immediately interchangeable. They blend. And at the end, they play all six at the same time. And you know what? It's not really a train wreck. But it should be, but it's not. Because well, I've the- heard – I mean, you're in Nashville. You're in Nashville. But I've heard that they yeah. actually have a cookie-cutter system now and how they write the songs and give it to the artist. So is that true or is that myth? Is that – Well, I don't – I'm not a song – I'm an arranger. I do some writing, but right. I, I there's groups here that do writing. Um, I've – I'm – I'm not trying to avoid the question. I just don't have an answer. I, I've heard for you, by the way, it's not even recent. I've heard for years that there's a formula, but I sure wish I could get that formula because I'd like to write a hit song. If you just have one of those, um, <laughs> I'm telling you, you can, but, but given the choice, here's something from the inside. You don't want, if you have a choice between, do I want a number one song or a classic? You'll make much more money on the classic long term. Right. But if you want it immediately, you want your number one. And then you can say you had a number one, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, but there is, do I think there's a formula? It, 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 there must be, but I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Taylor Swift wrote, uh, what was that mega hit? Was it two, three years ago? Um, Shake It Off. Mm-hmm. She wrote that in 15 minutes. But doesn't she co-write with a lot of people? Yeah, she co-wrote that with uh, was a I don't recall her name. It was a songwriter. Uh, it's a, one of the local uh, female songwriters that, that co-wrote it with her. Uh, yeah, I think if you look at the credits, I mean, I don't even know if she's written one song by herself. I mean, she writes a lot of the lyrics, and I think she comes up with like the hook or the melody. But there's always other. Way people. back in the day, I think she was, but I'm not sure. I, I have actually met her, but I but let me be clear: by no means do I know her. I don't know her much about her background, or but she's you know she is considered now the uh, you know she's a money machine. Now there's there's no doubt. Um, so Tim, but, let me ask you: so if somebody's yeah. watching this and they're a musician and they go to Nashville, I mean, they could actually rent out your studio. Or is your studio private? Uh, my studio is private. Uh, I okay. and let me let me be clear. I I just do uh, mixing. Now, I'm not saying if they were to come to Nashville um, and they wanted to record vocal, it's a case-by-case basis if you wanted to record with me. Um, I, I consider myself much more a mixing engineer, though, than a recording engineer, and those are two different arts. Right. Much like mastering, I've done it, but uh, there, there's a real art to mastering, and I'd rather not, but I've done it. Um, with that stated, I will throw this out for everybody in the audience. Um, I'll tell you what, if somebody wants to get a hold of me, if you have, and here's the thing, if you have existing tracks and you need them mixed, somebody get a hold of me. You can reach me 
at uh, use my uh, talk about watches address. Reach me at ttemple at talkaboutwatches.com. Uh, I'll mix your project for free. Wow. Did you hear that, everyone? We just get a whole, and I, well, I have to like the project, you know, don't bring right, me. Right, right. It can't be. Um, yeah, yeah, you, like, you, have, you have standards. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I've got this guy that writes the best white supremacist music you've ever heard. Uh, well, keep right on walking. I'm not going to do it. But uh, but I'm not why, a music Why would you do that? Like, why would you do that, Tim? Why would you offer I'll, that? I, I'll, I'll hook him up. Wow. How about so, that? I'll do that. Tim, Tim is bringing a ton of value to the Q&A audience here tonight. Unbelievable, Ryan. you guys. Ton of value. This is fun, man. We can just go. What else? So, uh, okay. So I ranted about music. I think I even got off time. I didn't think I answered your question. You um, answered all my questions. Okay, good, good. That's a relief because I'm I I kind of don't do that sometimes. Not on purpose. Well, and you know, and my, and my goal here was just so that people can get, get to know you. Like I said, I've watched you for years. I know a lot of people on here have watched you for years, and it's just a little behind the scenes to actually get to know your personality. We all know you're a funny guy. You do you do a. Uh, uh, impressions and you I know, we'll see you every well, once in a while. You to let loose. I very limited impressions. I do. Um, I just discovered um, that I can do. Um, I can do J. Montgomery Burns from The Simpsons. Yeah, excellent. And I didn't think much about it until I happened to do it in front of a professional impressionist, and he went, "Man, that's really good." And I thought, "It is." So then I started, I just kept doing it. And then I discovered, uh, because my speaking voice is similar to Harry Shearer, who does, of course, a lot of The Simpsons. So I, if he does the voice, I can probably get close. So that's right. how I do it. Um, I can sort of do a Marge Simpson, but he doesn't do that voice. I can't do Homer, though. <laughs> You've then, tried. Uh, I've heard you try before. That, uh, that's uh, Marge one octave down. Hello, everybody, except Homer. Do that, um, but that's about it. yeah. So it's a very narrow uh, bandwidth of uh, of bad impressions. What happens when we let Tim go? He can just go. I could just get off the screen, and he could just talk no, to you. Oh, well, we're not doing. Uh, we're, we're we'll do nothing like that. Um, yeah, I just. I uh, th this is a great social outlet for me because I'm very often a uh, the kind of like the, the the lone wolf. I think one of the reasons I excelled at photography is that it's a uh, it, it's a lone sport. Uh, you don't have to gather around and, uh, you know, have a bunch of people to do it. And uh, it's the same with the mixing engineer. You know, it's, it's just usually just me or me and an assistant. So, so going back to the talk about watches uh, yeah. real quick, I noticed it. So it's just you now usually is the face, right? What is Mike not doing it anymore? I really want Mike to do shows. Uh, for those of you who could reach out and hit Mike up on um, on Facebook or whatever, tell him to start doing shows. Because uh, and and thanks, Gus. That's that's very kind of you. I appreciate that. Um, the, Gus just wrote me a nice compliment there. Uh, I really want him to, to do shows, and uh, I I hope that he, that he uh, he will soon. Because I know that and it's not just me. I know a lot of the audience wants to see it, and I uh, and uh, he he's so good. He's that's really good. I, I don't. Mean, it's not. I don't know if he's gotten stage friends. Seriously, I I, I I he's. He stated that you know he was going to do it when you know the time is right, and I'm paraphrasing, but uh, I, I really want him to do it. Um, he is incredibly knowledgeable about watches. I, I would say he probably not even probably he does know more than I do about them. I think um, it'd be cool to see you guys back on screen together. I would love to do it. You know, I would, I would, uh, I would absolutely love the, if not in the same room, uh, much like we're doing. You know, I want to start oh, doing. Yeah. Uh, co-opted and, and um so i'm 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 really encouraging him to 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 do it so yeah in the meantime if uh some of you guys want to reach out and hit him up and go hey do a show that would be awesome because I'd, I'd love for him to do it but yeah but for the timing you're right you know i have done the uh, the vast majority of the shows mike actually did a couple at the very beginning for the record i don't don't make it sound like he's yeah, never I, I remember the first ones but yeah then it was short-lived it was short-lived it was and uh, i want him very much to do uh, to do shows and i hope he does uh, but in the meantime, yeah, you guys are stuck with uh, with me doing them. Well, Tim, we've got to bring you back on here. Uh, I'd love to do it when we get to find out uh, who that who you're mixing for, and uh, there's other things going on with your business. And I, I really want people to uh, 
to go to talkaboutwatches.com. I think it's a great resource. If you if you are just looking for watches, right now is a great time. Graduations, Father's Day is coming up. I yeah. know you guys just had a Father's Day special. You had some crazy Which, watches. By the way, um, but, that's a good point. If you haven't taken care of it, I'll give you two really quick. I'll recommend highly, depending on, on your budget. Um, we have a hell of a deal on a Curvex. It's a Curvex Swiss automatic. It's a $2,500 watch. It's gorgeous, classic, retro, uh, $399, never owned. It's new old stock directly from Gruen, gorgeous. Um, but something for everybody while they last, uh, the list, I don't know exactly. I know it's several hundred dollars, uh, original list. The Exo Retro P51 Mustang that actually has part of a P51 Mustang melted into the case, $34.95. Full yes. packaging, hologram. Everything. The same thing that went for hundreds of dollars. We got the mother of all deals on us. $34.95. Dad will love it. And that's $34.95. 95 cents. Yeah. Not $3,495. No, no, no. Good point. It is $34. And that includes shipping. Yeah, I saw it. It's it's beautiful. Yeah. I was looking at it. I was like, wow, this is yeah, a great it's price. Pretty much a must own. Unless you literally just don't like the watch. I can't fix that. But uh uh, that for dad, for granddad, for anybody that you sh you guys should go get that. And I should tell you, we can't get more when they're, when they're gone, they're gone. But right. they're literally from the EXO vault, and they're pristine. And uh, you should absolutely uh, get one of those. And uh, a quick reminder, by the way, for those of you who are just joining us, and I'm glad that you are. Uh, Cece just joined us. Cece Ramirez, hi. Um, this is actually your job. You should be doing this. <laughs> Um, join our, our email list, uh, talk about watches, uh, check us out on Facebook at the talk about watches page. There's a link there. Bob's going to post the link on the, all the replays here. If you'll go get on our email list and make sure this is important. When you sign up, you're going to get an email from us. Make sure that you respond to that email and confirm, and then you're on the list. And if you're on the list, somebody's going to win the value 7750, but Everybody is going to get a subscription from About Time Magazine Digital Edition, including access to their full archive. And this is not a trick. You, you won't get a bill. Uh, this isn't a 30 day trial. You will get a four issue subscription and access to the full archive. Just and that's just for just that's just for signing up for your mailing yes. list. So you're yes. getting something just for signing up for that. That's incredible. Get on the list. And by the way, if you don't know about Time Magazine, if you're a watch fan, you should be getting that magazine. It's, it's a, a great, great, it's a great magazine. Yeah, yeah. awesome it's magazine. Put out. Well, Tim, it's been a pleasure. We can go all night long. I know. And uh, suddenly, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so, look, an everybody, so for those of you who just joined us or have you caught this midstream, they're doing awesome giveaway. Tim's doing an awesome giveaway. But I need you guys to please, for everybody that showed up here tonight, I really appreciate it. Hashtag replay. Yes. Hashtag replay. And then we're going to go ahead and put the link for that giveaway and for that free subscription by joining his mailing list. And uh, we'll make sure that we get that in there and we'll shoot it out through all our channels, our Instagram, awesome. our Twitter, our Facebook. And so, yeah, this has been really fun. This has been a thrill for me, Tim. I really appreciate it. You're a... You're an awesome guy. And like I said in one of our copies, you're a true renaissance man. I mean, you are involved in so much stuff and you're very artistic and you're just uh, you're generous in what you do. And uh, that's why you've been so successful over the years. Well, well, that's very kind of you, Bob. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate the compliments very much. Uh, Bob, you've been very gracious host. Thank you for the invite. And I look forward to doing another show. This has been a fantastic experience. Thank you. Awesome. You guys appreciate it. Remember, hashtag like it, share it out there. And until next time, keep killing it. Keep rocking your businesses because you guys will succeed. And I hope you got some wisdom from Tim and make sure to go to his website. Until next time, you guys, see y'all later. Have a good night.